I'm going to show you very typical Korean meal right now. Uh, it's a super uh, heavy on best best uh, vegetables and um, well. Before I start everything, you know, like people people believe Korean people are very uh, um, kind of a special to uh, vegetarian cuisine. Uh, it's partially true and partially not. Uh, we we really love uh, beef and pork and all kind of meats, but. The, the fundamental uh, is actually all vegetarian and, and the, the way to enjoy those kind of a protein like a beef or pork, that kind of a thing, is impossible without you know, having all these uh, vegetable uh, side dishes or main dish. I have a bale rice over here. It's a steamed bale rice. I mix a little bit of a white rice for the, uh, the better uh, mouth texture. And this is just water or just tea. It's a bale tea. Normally, a uh, bale tea is more like kind of a uh, um, kind of a retro style uh, flavor. Uh, when I was uh, like a five or ten, when I was a young, you know, without drinking this bale tea, you know, I cannot start, you know, eating something. And just pure white water or clear water is flavorless. It's just water. So. Uh, you know, I, I believe the entire Korean people loved, you know, you know, bring some bale tea uh, and, and having with the other uh, meal. Here we have a, a miyok soup. Miyok is, uh, uh, is known as a wakame in, uh, in, in Japanese and, and I, I believe a, a lot of American people are used to a Japanese name, uh, but this is miyok. Uh, so there are three major uh, seaweeds that uh, Korean people love. So this is uh, one of it. And this is a hot soup, and it's a super simple soup made out of uh, milk, and garlic, and uh, perilla seeds oil. And normally we add uh, uh, some sort of like a, a beef stock or, or clam stock to add more flavor, this, but this is pure uh, seaweed soup. Next, I have a, the kind of a cold version of this seaweed soup. Uh, it shares pretty much uh, every ingredients with this one, but it's a cold version. So uh, it's called the, uh, the miyok nengku, and that, that refers like seaweed cold soup. So basically, it's the same miyok as the, uh, the previous one, but this one uh, has more components for the, uh, the texture, like a cucumber, onion, and some sesame seeds, and there's some uh, uh, red chili. And this is more like a kind of a summer version of this hot soup. Some people like and some people actually really hate because it's a kind of a, a little bit sour, a little bit savory, and it's a cold. And, and seaweed itself is not like super, super popular ingredients. But I really love uh, this cold soup. It's like having um, kind of a sushi, but without fish. Uh, and it's really refreshing. And it's like, it's, it's, this position is like in between soup, salad, and drink. And next, I have another uh, seaweed side dish. Uh, this is called the tot. And it's actually, uh, it has kind of a, um, interesting shapes. It's sort of like grapes. It has a whole bunch of like uh, some pots and this one you can add to the uh, rice for the, uh, the making steamed rice. And when, in, when this is cooked, it actually changes the color. And the, uh, the, the main character of this seaweed is the uh, texture. It, like, it actually pops in your mouth. And it has a, a more tougher texture compared to uh, this uh, meal. But it, it, it has its own character. And it's, it's normally, uh, normally flavored with a little bit of a, a, um, vinegar and salt and a little bit of a sugar and soy sauce. And this is my favorite seaweed and probably uh, what most Korean people love. Uh, it's called kim. Unlike the, uh, this miyok, it's actually um, 
like some of little particles of uh, GIM. GIM is very, very brittle, um, kind of a, a cotton looking texture. So like uh, fishmonger actually gather all this GIM and spread out on the other thin uh, slate and let it dry. And this is uh, the result. And there is the uh, uncooked GIM and cooked GIM. And this one is actually cooked, cooked GIM. Uh, it's, it's baked with the uh, uh, sesame oil. And normally people like uncooked uh, gim for uh, making kimbap, uh, which is the, uh, the, the rice roll. And some people, just like my wife, it just, just prefer uncooked one rather than the, uh, the cooked one. But my favorite is a cooked one because it's, it has a really, really good texture. And I just like this sound. It's, it's so good. And it's salty, very... Uh, toasty and it goes really really well with the uh, white rice and this is this this is a third uh, series that I mentioned about like a three most favorite series uh, it's Tashima uh, it's also known as a um, kombu in, in Japanese this one's a pretty tough and thick but it has the it is the, the main source of umami so people love to use this uh, uh, Tashima for brewing some uh, seaweed stock uh, as well as um, um, some like just, just extracting the umami for, uh, from this seaweed. But this one we actually made a pugak which is the uh, 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 deep fried Tashima uh, for, for snack. People eat, eat this form as a, as a side dish of their meal as well as just the uh, pure snack, just like eating, eating a, you know, like a potato chips. Uh, this is a seaweed chips. Uh, I'm gonna use this for a small amateur bush for my restaurant. We have a uh, uh, kangdenjang, which is the uh, uh, vegetable stew with, uh, with denjang. And this one has a lot of form. Like if you add more water into this one, you can make this, you can actually transfer this into a soup and if you reduce it down to like this texture, it's called the kangdenjang. It's, it, it's, it's used for like kind of a sauce and the main dish at the same time. And normally this kangdenjang goes really well with the, uh, the ripi vegetable we call it sam. And I, I, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what sam is. So I have a, a, a lettuce over here, uh, perilla leaf, um, some Mustard, mustard leaves, uh, kale, and chard. And this is the most popular uh, some components for pretty much every people. And, and whoever goes to whatever Korean barbecue restaurant, this is a kind of a fundamental thing uh, goes, goes with the uh, uh, pork. It really depends on like your taste to choose uh, like what, what ripi vegetable you have. But you know, like a lettuce has a, a kind of a pure flavor and it's strong enough to hold the, uh, all the ingredients inside. I prefer to have a kind of a double layer uh, with this uh, perilla leaf um, like this for the, uh, the better grip and better like uh, um, um, the area. And kind of a stronger or tougher vegetable like a kale or a shark. We cannot talk about Korean traditional cuisine without rice because it's, it's actually uh, uh, the base of everything. That's why entire like a Korean side dishes has a little bit stronger uh, than what it's supposed to be because it's supposed to be uh, eaten with uh, uh, white rice. And then I'm gonna put a little bit of uh, this kangdenjang. Oh, by the way, uh, there's some uh, zucchini, onion, um, mushroom, and hot chili inside. And I add uh, actually a little bit of a snail. Uh, it's not normal. Normally people add a kind of a sea snail. Yeah. But I just consider this snail as a sea snail. Yeah. I have a... Uh, um, kind of a ripi vegetable over here, some uh, carbohydrate, and some uh, salty and savory components from this kangdenjang, and maybe a little bit of a spicy from kimchi. Just a little bit. 
And if you have any sort of like a um, like cooked fish or pork or beef, whatever protein that has the fat and protein, you can add on top uh, on this sun. And you just simply make a pouch like this. And just hold it as a like a one small pouch and just eat it. Uh, let me eat this. And never goes two bite with the sum. It's always one bite. No matter how big you made your sum, it's your it's your duty to have a just a one bite. Hmm. I guess um, all these uh, repeat vegetables are um, familiar to American people except this. This is a uh, um, perilla leaves. Um, you know, in Japanese food culture, you might heard the shiso. Shiso is a lot smaller, but actually, it's a similar family, but has totally different flavors. It's actually uh, sweet and very like bright, and it's. Um, I think it's the best way to describe how taste the shiso like. It's more like it's, it's candy, candy flavor. Because it's super strong, like a minty, sweet flavor, it goes well with the fish and some sweet stuff. So like normally when you have a, a sushi rice, uh, it's, it's, it's flavored with a little bit of sugar and some, some vinegar. So, so it, it's, a, it's basically sweet rice and it goes really well with the shiso. But this one is more like a savory side. It's actually very savory and it's, it's tougher and it's thicker. And the size of this perilla leaf, well, well, this one is a quite big one. Uh, normally, it's a little bit smaller than this one. But because it, uh, Korean um, gennip has more like a savory and a little bit of, like a bitterness and toasty flavor, it goes well with the uh, meat. Um, and it actually, it goes really well with pretty much everything. Like everything has some strong flavor. It goes really well with this one. And kind of a minty family, repeat vegetable goes well with the other uh, fatty uh, ingredients. So um, this is a super, super close friends to the uh, um, Korean, you know, samgyeopsal, uh, which is a pork belly. But beef goes really well. Uh, even some uh, hui, which is even some sashimi goes really well with this one. But if you don't add uh, these components like a uh, doenjang or gochujang, Normally, uh, the flavor of this perilla leaf actually consume the other flavor of the fish. So I think the best way to enjoy this perilla leaf is having some chang with it. And I think that's really, really special uh, about the Korean cuisine. Even, even I don't have any, any, any meat contents over here. I only had the rice, which is the, uh, the, the base uh, item. And um, gangdaejang, uh, which is the uh, sort of like half sauce and half uh, main dish, but normally people consider this as a sauce. So I only have uh, the base item and sauce and repeat vegetable, but it's uh, good enough. It has every flavor, like it has a texture from this ballet, and the saltiness and savory and some umami from this vegetable and jang, and. This, uh, this candy actually grabs the whole thing and fill all the gaps in between. So let's move on to uh, uh, seaweed. When I worked at Per Se, uh, which is a, a Michelin three-star French restaurant, like, uh, the head chef really uh, liked the, uh, the seaweeds. So uh, he, he tried to make the, uh, the one of his brushes out of the, uh, uh, this meal. And normally, uh, meal is in the uh, dry form like this because it's, the season is pretty short. Uh, in the spring season, you can actually have the uh, uh, the mulmio, which is a water, like an undried uh, meal. It's pretty uh, thick and, and big. And normally people have it with the uh, um, kind of a sour uh, gochujang, uh, but this is a normal form. And because it's dried, this is like kind of a base ingredients what every Korean household have and when you buy this it is it's, it's literally like immortal it is it's, it's never gonna go bad unless you actually water it so 
only this amount of uh, meal when you when you water this when you soak this it actually uh, more than this much it, it 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 this volume is like 10 times bigger than the other uh, dry form and what i really love about this meal is that like it it actually has um no flavor like it doesn't have uh, that much of umami like dashima uh, or that much of a kind of a sea flavor like kim but this one has a very very unique texture like it's slippery uh, it's, it's almost like a paper thin um, thickness yeah because uh, if you had the same amount of milk uh, uh, if, if you had the same amount of uh, tashima and kim as much as a meal, it's going to be too much and it's going to actually mum your uh, tongue because it's too strong, too strong umami and too strong like a sea flavor for me. But this one is kind of a moderate, so like this one I can have an um, you know, entire bowl of soup without like eating the, all these side dishes. And by the way, uh, this seaweed soup is a symbol of birth. So every birthday, you know, you know parents actually uh, cook this soup for the uh, for the breakfast. It's like it's like ritual. And whoever uh, uh, had a child, this is the first thing they got served. Yeah, uh, this cold soup is kind of a controversial uh, soup, and there are like a half Korean people who don't like this one, and half Korean people like this one, but. Uh, what I love about this cold soup is that, you know, I, I, I've, ne I've never seen a cold soup outside of Korea. And normally this um, flavor is like a sweet and sour and savory and somewhat similar to like a sports drink. But it has a lot of uh, um, like savory ingredients. So, so it sounds quite weird, but this when you when you have this entire ingredients uh, delivers like like cool cool feeling the temperature wise this soup is cold but you know cucumber and cold seaweeds and the onion and the mouse texture and entire feeling is that like you're having a swim in the hot summer in the sea and that's what's happening in your mouth and and that's a, that's what I really love about and I, I think I need to mention this little ingredients, what's uh, flooring on top of this cold soup, and it's uh, uh, sesame seeds. Uh, like, among the shop, we had a joke that like, whatever you make, sprinkle a little bit of a sesame seeds, that's a Korean dish. Because the sesame flavor and sesame seeds itself is like the most popular garnish of the Korean side dish. And the flavor of that nuttiness from sesame seeds goes pretty much everywhere. Like, like even this kim has a, a sesame oil. This one has a little bit of a sesame oil. Even this soup has a sesame oil. This one, uh, I use a different kind of a sesame oil, but it has a, a similar flavor. Yeah. Even I use a sesame oil for my dessert and uh, dessert with the uh, vanilla ice cream. Uh, people really loved it. And that's because the sesame oil or sesame seed has a flavor of like um, truffle. It's not the, the same uh, aroma, but the feeling is same. It actually explodes its uh, uh, aroma. And when you have it, you actually um, can't think about anything else but just sesame oil. That's, that's what happens when you smell truffle oil. You just kind of stop thinking about everything and just like, like feeling like captured by truffle and there's always truffle. And even after like a few minutes of uh, uh, smelling truffle, it's still like, like happening inside over here. That's the same thing as the sesame seeds. And, and we really love the sesame seeds. To, to mention what's coming after this one, I need to mention this barley tea. Um, so, you know, many people talk about like kimchi, fermentation, some doenjang, gochujang, uh, when, they, when they talk about Korean uh, food culture. But I really love to mention grain, like eating grains 
is like, I guess it's the fundamental of a Korean cuisine. Because even like making gochujang, you might need a rice, a rice glue. And to make this tenjang, you also need the beans, which is the grain. And rice itself is, you know, without doubt, is the base of the Korean cuisine. And we eat a lot of grains, a lot. When you go to supermarket, you can see almost like 20 or 30 different kinds of grain. And there's the, uh, some um, like mixture of the uh, grains uh, that goes really well with the rice. And we even make the tea out of grains. So we normally use a, a barley for the barley tea. Uh, we have a corn tea, corn husk tea, and some uh, burdock tea. And, and just the rice tea. And even like after you make this rice, there's always like kind of a burnt bottom uh, when, you, when you scrub all the uh, uh, well steamed parts. That's the key ingredients of making sungyeong, which is the uh, burnt rice tea. Yeah, it sounds weird, but that's, that's how we eat. And even before the, the coffee culture actually hit, the, uh, hit this country, people love to have the, uh, that rice tea because it shares a similar flavor profile, just like coffee. When you have a, a Americano or just brewed coffee, it's a mixture of a, kind of a savory bitterness and a little bit of a sweet flavor. And that bitterness actually uh, make you feel, uh, you kind of uh, settle down what's, what happened in your mouth and feel comfortable. And, and the bitterness actually uh, make you uh, make, make, make you feel comfortable and same thing happened over here so after you cook the rice there's always a, a burnt part back in the days when we have just the, uh, the kind of a cast iron uh, a rice pot it has to be burnt part on the bottom and to clean it you have to add a little bit of a water to clean it uh, like easily but even if you add a water to the uh, uh, burnt rice bottom, it doesn't mean it's dirty. It's, the, uh, it's edible, edible water and edible rice. It's not like, like burnt as black, it's like brown uh, burnt. So when you actually boil that burnt part with the rice, entire water turns into sort of like coffee flavor water. And it has a bitterness, it has the, uh, enough starch came from the uh, rice and it, it also has all sort of like sweet flavor from the, uh, um, from the rice. So it has pretty much everything and it's warm. And like when you talk about wine pairing, like, you know, this wines came from this area and, and that's why the food from this area goes well with the wine and then people call it terroir. It's the same thing, terroir. When you had a rice, there's a rice tea. It has to be you know, perfect matching together. And it's not just the uh, um, tea that you are drinking after, you know, eating this regular meal. Sometimes people add this tea into the rice and this, they just mix rice with tea. You know, like one of very special Korean, you know, eating habit is mix rice with soup. It's called kukba. And I know some people really freaked about like put some rice into soup. But that's, that's how we eat. And in this form, it's one, like kind of a, uh, one combination of meal. But when you mix this rice into the soup, this is a standalone dish. And just like that, we like add some water into the rice. And why they do is quite, quite interesting because uh, um, when they have a, you know, meal and all the side dishes are sort of like what people don't like, their best option is put some water into the rice and make super plain gukbap. So it doesn't have any saltiness and sweetness, but it's, it has the same grain flavor, so it matches together. And actually, I took the idea from that uh, eating habit to make uh, my kind of a, a contemporary style gukbap, which I'm going to sh uh, show you right after this one. And so even, even this entire combination of meal is a super 
simple and nothing special. I, I, I strongly believe that if I serve this entire this meal to like kind of a random Korean, they feel like there's nothing special because it's too common. It's actually super common. And I believe people are going to complain about like absence of the uh, uh, meat, but this is that common uh, like Korean like food combination. But it has pretty much everything and there's nothing actually lack of uh, uh, flavor like salty, sweetness, a little bit of a bitterness, spiciness, and there's some, some, some wet parts and dry parts and it has pretty much everything. And the cool thing is that, you know, even, even I make some joke about this one too. Um, so if you had a, like, um, like, um, like a beef patty over here, you can actually make the, uh, the hamburger uh, combination. Yeah, so patty, a little bit of a rice instead of a bread, and there's some ripy vegetable like a lettuce and some sauces. So it shares very, very similar uh, like flavor profile, and, but it's just a different form. And yeah, and, and, yeah, and this is how, how we eat. But I love to pick the idea of eating grain and some tea and rippy vegetables and some seeds and yeah i think that's pretty much it